Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the 2021 Sustainable Development Report. We are so thrilled to have you all with us today. Um, the team has worked really hard on this edition, and it has some very interesting findings, which we'll hear about in just a moment. But we're going to start with some welcoming remarks from Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, and thanks to uh, Guillaume Lafortune and the whole team uh, that has prepared uh, this year's very, very powerful, very interesting and very significant sustainable development report. Uh, this has been uh, quite a, a saga the last couple of years. And one of the uh, points of emphasis of this year's report is that the SDGs took a hit uh, as the whole world took a hit from COVID-19. Uh, after year after year of progress, uh, last year was a year of regress, not only a, a disastrous uh, global health crisis uh, and a short-term economic crisis, but a reversal of progress on the sustainable development goals. Uh, we're one day after the G7 summit, where uh, the G7 leaders pledged uh, to uh, do their utmost to promote the success of the Sustainable Development Goals globally. And they noted several areas of important action. Our report this year is a report about action, about the investments that are needed, not as the G7 said to build back better, but as uh, we say, uh, to build forward better. Uh, this is the UN's vision. Uh, it is the vision of the Sustainable Development Report 2021 to build back and to build forward uh, because we are not only recovering, we need to achieve goals that we were uh, committed to beforehand and not even on track to achieve at that point. So building forward better is the essence at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we have been emphasizing the major societal transformations that are needed for success of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. Major transformations to ensure universal uh, access to quality education and skills, universal access to healthcare, of course, a clean, energy and clean industry, uh, sustainable land use, sustainable cities where now more than half the world's population lives and access to digital technologies that offer leapfrog potential across the board in access to health services, to education, to finance and payments, to government services, to ecological monitoring, to business development. And so our focus is on not only gauging progress or in the case of 2020, regress relative to the SDGs and helping countries to understand where they stand in absolute terms and in relative terms and on which of the 17 SDGs they face crises or have uh, the green light that all is okay, but also how to ensure these six major transformations. And this year's report talks about policy tracking so that countries can follow what they need to do in public policy to ensure success in these broad transformations. Now, one uh, final theme that I want to mention just in these brief introductory remarks is financing. The sustainable development goals are at the core a, an investment program, a massive investment in prosperity, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. Achieving quality education for all, universal health care coverage, green energy, sustainable land use, and the other transformations are all investments. They require uh, not only investing in skills and in people and in infrastructure and in business development, they require the financing to make that possible. So one of the themes of this year's report is finding 
the fiscal and the financial space to enable the SDG investments to ensure that indeed this is the decade of action for the sustainable development goals. Let me uh, again thank the wonderful team that has led this year's report. I want to thank all of the participants uh, in uh, today's launch event. We have several esteemed world leaders representing uh, their countries and uh, their commitment to sustainable development. So let me thank you. And now it's my pleasure to uh, turn uh, the uh, podium over to Guillaume Lafortune, who leads the team that produces the uh, sustainable development report. And we're going to hear a summary of the main conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here again this year to launch the sixth edition of the Sustainable Development Report um, 2021. Um, I'm Guillaume Lafortune. I'm the director of the SDS in Paris, one of the co-author of this report alongside Professor Sachs, Dr. Christian Kroll, uh, but also my two colleagues, Finn Worm and, and, and Grayson uh, Fuller. Um, before yeah. I start- oh, Guillaume, I'm sorry, your slides aren't Full screen, they're still in PowerPoint view. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. There we go. Great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, before I jump into the, the key insights, the results, let me thank our partners at the Bertelsmann Stiftung, also our publishers at Cambridge University Press, but also the whole SDSN Secretariat and family as a whole. Um, it's really uh, a report which benefits from contribution and key inputs from all of our networks uh, around the world and also our distinguished speakers who are here, here um, with us um, today. So this year's uh, edition is available uh, online uh, on our website sdgindex.org since this morning. It is a report as emphasized by Professor Sachs about actions and um, the recovery. Um, and um, I'm going to walk you through now some of the key insights and, and, and results. So, you know, I'm going to first mention what are some of the, those, those findings and then present some of the key charts and, and results from, from the report. But if I want to summarize the, the report, I think, you know, we can focus on five key findings this year. Um, the first one, which is, um, which is obviously, uh, you know, very important and which has been already mentioned by Professor Sachs, is that for the first time, since we have started monitoring um, the SDGs in, in 2015, this is the first time the SDG index has declined in 2020, right? So since 2015, we were seeing some progress. We, we could always say that the pace was not sufficient or that you know, it varied across goals and across countries, but overall there was progress happening. Uh, 2020 is a setback for sustainable development everywhere. At the same time, the report emphasizes how the SDGs provide the right framework for building forward better. The second major um, uh, finding, and this is the topic of the first uh, chapter of the report, is that developing countries need increased fiscal space to finance both the emergency uh, measures, but also the investment-led uh, recovery. Right? So compared with high-income countries, access to uh, international financial markets um, has been lower in many developing um, countries. So there's a real risk that we end up with an uneven or divergent recovery with some countries um, uh, recovering much faster than, uh, than others. And so the report identifies some key ways um, to increase uh, fiscal uh, space in developing countries as emphasized under SDG 17. The third finding is that Finland tops the 2021 SDG index. So congratulations to, to Finland. We're delighted to have um, Minister Skinari with us uh, today. Um, Finland tops the, the index followed by two Nordic uh, countries. Yet no country has a perfect score. No country is on track for achieving all of the goals. Um, and so as for other OECD countries, there's still major SDG challenges uh, that remain. The fourth finding is that there's still a gap between the commitments and the actions for the SDGs. We do every year in partnership with our networks, uh, a survey of government efforts for the SDGs where we do see you know, a lot of commitments and, and, and high level speeches supporting the SDGs. 
but the integration within public management practices and uh, procedures, including, for instance, uh, budget, but also recovery plans um, could be uh, improved. And this gap should be addressed in order to achieve major SDG transformations by 2030 and uh, beyond. And finally, the decade of action for the SDGs requires a strong multilateral um, system that includes obviously the leadership from G7, G20, but also the UN system as a whole. And we're, we're delighted to have uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa with, with, with us uh, uh, today. And part of the, the challenge is to address those negative international spillovers, um, which can be embodied into unsustainable supply chains and trade, for instance, but also through um, profit shifting or financial secrecy, which undermine countries' abilities to achieve the SDGs and leverage the resources needed um, to achieve the goals. So that is a, a brief summary of some of the key findings. Let me walk you through in the next couple of minutes, and I'll have to be quite quick because we have a very packed agenda today through some of the key charts and figures of this year's edition. So the first one, and we saw since this morning a little bit of, of, of media coverage around this first finding, is that 2020 is a major setback for sustainable development everywhere. So you see that since 2015, there was progress uh, happening. 2020 led to a reversal um, of, of progress. And in fact, this reversal is likely underestimated because we don't have yet all the data integrated within the index uh, this year due to time lags in, in international statistics. But for this year's SDG index, um, most of the decline is explained by two key uh, variables. These are the increase in extreme uh, poverty, people living with less than $1.90 a day, where we see that even in regions which already have relatively high levels of poverty, there has been an increase. So you see here the numbers for Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in other parts of the world, including Latin America and the Caribbean. The other um, indicator that explains this decline is unemployment rate, which has increased um, in uh, all world major regions. The um, first chapter covers this issue of fiscal space in uh, developing countries. In order to suppress the, the pandemic, we also achieved the, the SDGs. And as mentioned, this is emphasized under SDG 17, Partnership for, for the Goal, which recognizes the need to mobilize um, public financing for developing countries. And the report highlights four, at least four key ways in order to, to address this. One is improve global monetary uh, management, notably through increased um, liquidity. Uh, for low-income developing countries. And here, the chapter emphasizes the role, obviously, of international monetary policy, but also of key institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. The second um, way is improve tax collection and domestic resource uh, mobilization supported by several global tax uh, reforms. So I think it's, it's always good to remind ourselves that some of the top countries in the SDG index, Nordic countries, um, collect government revenue of around 50% um, of their GDP. Um, and so, um, you know, there's also global tax reforms that can help here, including combat tax havens, financial secrecy, and, and profit shifting. The third way is increased financial intermediation by multilateral development banks. And this is really one of the key points of the, of the chapter, the role of MDBs to support um, investment into those, those infrastructure, as mentioned by Professor Sachs. MDBs can borrow on more favorable market terms, but also equipped internally. Um, to handle complex lending uh, for infrastructure projects. And the fourth point is on debt relief as emphasized by SDG 17.4. Professor Sykes has mentioned the six transformations uh, framework um, and the report emphasized how the SDGs and this framework can be a guidepost to help uh, build forward better. I'm not gonna go through the six transformation. They have been mentioned by Professor Sykes already just to mention that those can help guide the recovery plans but also investment um, uh, strategies. They are underpinned by two key principles, which are leave no one behind and circularity and decoupling. This framework has been published in 2019 in, in, in Nature. Finland tops the SDG index uh, this year. Um, so we use around 91 global indicators, which we transform on a scale from zero to 100. We use about two thirds of official statistics from UN custodian agencies, one third of non-official statistics from research centers, academia, NGOs. Um, our, I'm not gonna go th too much through our methodology. There's a lot available online. Our method has been peer reviewed, um, has been statistically audited um, as well uh, already. But so once we do this SDG index this year, Finland is at the 
top uh, of the of the index. What's interesting also is that Finland comes out as one of the country when we do our government efforts survey, which shows the greatest level of, of commitments and actions also um, for, for, for the SDGs. Another interesting point, and I'm not going to spend too much time on Finland, we have uh, Minister Skenari with us today, but is that, you know, Finland also topped this year in March the World Happiness uh, Report. Um, so it seems like um, sustainable and, and happiness, there might be some, um, some connections uh, here. Uh, and and uh, so Finland is tops those two reports, which uh, are led by uh, Professor Sachs and, and, and published by the, by the SDSN. In terms of progress since 2015, East and South Asia is the region that progressed most since the uh, adoption of the SDGs. In fact, the country that progressed the most since 2015, according to our, to our uh, results, is Bangladesh. We're delighted to have Mr. Abdul uh, Karamasad from Bangladesh with us um, today. Um, by contrast, some of the countries that regress the most since the adoption of the SDGs, and I'll focus here on countries with population above 1 million, are Venezuela and uh, Brazil um, as well. In terms of the goals, there is obviously variations on how each of the goals have progressed. We do see since 2015 um, some good progress on SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, also on no poverty before the pandemic. Um, by contrast, progress on SDG 12 to 15 has been um, a bit more slow or even going in the wrong direction. And this echoes also the findings of other international reports which, which call for further actions on, on climate and biodiversity. Major challenge remain in all countries, including those that are at the top of the SDG index. Here you have the average dashboard for high income countries where if we want to cluster the challenges for this group of countries, there would be probably three. One challenge is around climate and biodiversity, SDG 12 to 15, where you see red uh, in the dashboards, but also around sustainable diets covered under SDG 2. Uh, a second challenge is on SDG 10, uh, inequalities. And the third one, which you have here at the bottom left um, of the screen, is around international spillovers, right? Those impacts um, outsourced abroad through trade or financial flows, um, for instance. And so when we plot um, with a chart the average performance of countries on the SDG index, we see, for instance, that OECD countries perform best on the SDG index, but also outsource to a larger, to a larger extent impact uh, abroad, which is covered here in the International Spillover Index, where the lower the score, the more the negative um, spillovers. And we cover four aspects of spillovers, environmental and social spillovers in trade, direct cross-border flows in air and water. There's a, there's a data gap here, so we don't have data about this, but in theory, this is also an important spillover, which we would like to track moving forward. And then in international economic and financial flows, profit shifting, uh, tax havens, financial secrecy, peacekeeping and security, for instance, the export of major conventional weapons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude uh, now just to say that there's very detailed results um, that are available in our report. There's country profiles for 193 UN member states where you have all those detailed findings indicator by indicator. As emphasized by Professor Sachs, we have a very significant section this year on com government uh, commitments actions and on statistics where we do see this gap between statements and um, the integration of the SDGs in national budget, but also in national um, recovery, uh, recovery plans. And uh, finally, the report is available on the SDG index website, also um, on the report of our publisher, um, Cambridge uh, University Press. This report is part of a series of reports. So obviously the latest edition is this global edition. We also have regional editions and editions that we do um, to use the SDG framework at the local uh, and city level. And to mention that at SDG uh, Academy, uh, we have a course on measuring uh, sustainable development if you're interesting, uh, interested to, to learn more. If you have any questions, we have uh, an email address, info at sdgindex.org. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, and back to you, um, Lauren. Thank you so much, Guillaume. Um, I do think we maybe have one quick question uh, for you that we'll take, and this came up in the chat as well as by email from uh, John and Grenada. Um, so John is specifically asking about challenges with reporting on SIDS. The question in the chat is about countries that are not ranked. Maybe we very briefly can address that. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, you know, one of the major challenges for small island developing states is the availability um, of data. So actually, if you look at our 
list of countries that we cannot cover in the SDG um, index. Most of them are small island uh, developing states. So in order to reduce the bias due to missing uh, data, countries need to have data for 80% of the indicators in order to be included in the index. And so a lot of those, of those SIDS um, countries are not uh, included in the index. We still publish country profiles um, for those countries who are UN uh, member states, because we think that one of the value of this report is also to highlight where um, data is, is missing uh, and to put forward an agenda also for strengthening um, statistical uh, capacity and data availability for the, the, the SDGs. So this is a, a, a major uh, challenge uh, on the, for, for, for SIDS countries. And we're actually working right now on the issue of vulnerability um, and connecting those specific vulnerabilities of SIDS countries with um, SDG outcomes, but also with financing uh, mechanisms specifically for, for SIDS. Great, thank you, Guillaume. And now let's turn to one of our, um, you know, real positive news stories from this report. We're going to head over to uh, number one, Finland. We're so thrilled to have Minister uh, Skinari with us today. Minister, please, the floor is yours. Uh, excellencies, uh, dear friends, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And it's a great honor for me to speak on this occasion on behalf of the Finnish uh, government and of Prime Minister Sanna Marin. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the Bertelsmann uh, Stiftung for the excellent work you have done in SDG communications over the years. You have underlined the importance of reliable data and showed uh, how it can be used effectively. The Nordic countries uh, have positioned well in, in global rankings when it comes to SDG implementation. I believe that there is a strong linkage between uh, the core idea of sustainable development uh, to ensure human well-being within environmental boundaries and the Nordic model, as we call it. The Nordic societies are built on a strong welfare model and a social contract with public institutions that enjoy a high level of trust among citizens. Even though Nordic countries uh, do well in the sustainability comparisons, we, st we are still far from reaching uh, all the SDGs by 2030. In Finland, we have achieved or are close to achieving uh, the SDGs on poverty, alleviation, health, education, water and energy, reducing inequality, peace and the rule of law. However, we still have significant challenges that relate to climate change, consumption and production patterns biodiversity and the level of funding for development cooperation. Leaving no one behind is the, the core principle of the uh, 2030 agenda. And uh, we know that the COVID uh, pandemic has seriously affected many countries' abilities to reach the SDGs. The pandemic has led to an increase in extreme poverty and inequality and resulted in a uh, deterioration in gender equality. We must uh, I, I, I intensify our efforts and ensure that the most vulnerable are not left further behind by the pandemic. The implementation of the 2030 Agenda requires effective multilateralism with a reformed United Nations at its core and increased support for the rules-based international order. The importance of uh, tackling climate change and defending human rights will grow in a global context. Finland wants to find sustainable solutions for, for these common challenges. 
Dear friends, globally, the funding needed to meet the SDGs is estimated to be thousands of billions of euros on uh, an annual basis. Governments alone cannot fill this gap. We need the private sector and all relevant financial players on board if we are to achieve uh, and make real change. As the Minister of Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade, uh, I'm so happy to tell you that my government has recently issued uh, the report on development policy across parliamentary terms to the parliament. The report strengthens the long-term approach in Finnish development cooperation from the perspective of principles, values and goals and, and makes development policy more focused. The report also reiterates Finland's commitment to direct 0.7% uh, of GNI to development cooperation and 0.2% of GNI to the least developed countries. The target year to reach this goal is 2030. Here in Finland, uh, we've seen that uh, a systemic, long-term and also holistic approach is needed in achieving uh, transformation in sustainability. We need to take uh, fundamental new steps and make system level changes for the transformation to happen. At the moment, we are preparing a national 2030 agenda roadmap that supports this approach. We have identified six areas where changes are needed, such as food and energy systems, diversity in the use of land and forests, and sustainable consumption. In, on these areas, we are right now identifying concrete steps further, further and with the carbon neutrality roadmaps, which are actually strategic as we combine each and every sector together. I'd like to, to finish by underlining the importance of sustainable development report. For us, it's an honor to be at the top of the list this year. It has taken hard work and dedication from our whole society. However, this also makes us humble as, as we still have a way to go to reach all the SDGs. I would like to also inform that Finland co-chairs with Indonesia the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action. Coalition member countries share the basic idea that climate change must be embedded into the tools of economic and financial policies and the coalition has more than 60 member countries already and the number is growing. Ladies and gentlemen, Finland is always open to, to share our experiences and assist countries wishing to accelerate their implementation of the SDGs. The universal spirit and ambitious goals of the 2030 agenda is within the reach of the international community. Let's seize the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister. And if you'll entertain us for one uh, brief question from Gareth in the UK, what do you think is the role of local authorities and how is that changing? Is it increasing, decreasing? Over to you. Well, thank you. When it comes to local communities, I think uh, the city of Lahti, where I'm coming from and where I'm physically now, which is the green capital of Europe this year, it's a good example that how important it is that we involve the local citizens, especially the social dimension, meaning the education, the employment, but also the public-private partnerships, what we've been doing in order to uh, enable the, the, the green uh, transition in energy sector, water sector and so forth. So for a country like Finland, I think it's a good example that how important are the cities and, and municipalities and the fact that you really have to have citizens on board if you want to make a change. And I think that is the very core of the whole SDG uh, 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 
uh, a setup and the whole concept. And that's something that we are currently deploying to, to, to our colleagues in Europe, but also at the global level. And I really appreciate the cooperation, what we've been doing with different countries and different cities. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much. And congratulations again, uh, Minister Skinari, for the performance of Finland. We're going to continue with our great success stories and turn to Bangladesh. Uh, over to you, Mr. Abdul Kalam Azad. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Bangladesh. It's a great pleasure for me to join this important high level virtual launch event today on behalf of Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina. I thank the event Sustainable Development Solution Network and Bertelsmann for jointly organizing this event. I'm very happy hearing that Bangladesh did very well in the developing countries in Asia in implementing the SDG. So Bangladesh as an active participant in the global process of preparing the Agenda 2030, started its implementation from the very beginning of uh, the journey of SDG, integrating SDG into the national development agenda. SDG in Bangladesh is a part of our perspective plan 2041. And we have a visionary plan, long plan, Delta plan, which we call 2100 from now about 80 years. 2100 dazzling delta. So Bangladesh's SDG implementation is blessed with strong political will and the persistent support of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who is the signatory of both MDG and SDG. Whole of the society approach involving private sector, academia, women, media, youth, and local level representative. From the very beginning, we had a robust implementation plan, which has been mentioned by Sachs also in his speech. We planned basing on the, each of the target by involving all the ministries and the departments. We allocated the responsibility according to them, according to this, they prepared their detailed work plan. They are medium, uh, long-term and uh, visionary plan. Keeping in mind the resource constraint, we identified important 39 issues, which uh, from amongst 169 is DG. So these uh, targets on 39, like uh, education, primary health care, maternal mortality, child mortality, women empowerment, and so on. So these 39, are related, closely related with all, all other SDG. And um, each of the local government, they identified this 39, we have 39 plus one. What is this plus one? This is the localization of SDG. Each of the local government identified where they are lagging behind. This is leave no one behind, reach the farthest, reach the vulnerable person first. From the local level of about 500 local unit and 64 districts identified their area of importance. Likewise, government is also trying to mobilize resources for implementing these 39 plus one along with all other SDG. For both localization of SDG and leave no one behind, resources from local and the development partner go side by side. We have a very strong SDG monitoring team reporting to the head of the government frequently. SDG tracker is developed where we put due weightage of all the activities. This SDG tracker, very good uh, uh, platform. Uh, Bangladesh shared with some other country also. Bangladesh has also shared a number of innovations in SDG with other countries through the South-South network for public service innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to share with you that our poverty has been decreased significantly in the last decade. Except the COVID-19 pandemic period, 
Bangladesh maintained the public debt to GDP ratio is about 32 and maintain 35% for a decade from fiscal year 2008-9, which is below the responsible threshold of 40%. And currently, Bangladesh has foreign currency reserve of more than $45 billion, able to mend the import expenditure for nine months. Even during this pandemic, Bangladesh GDP per capita stands at 2,227 US dollar, which was only 1,887 1, last year. So therefore, Bangladesh economy is well prepared to caution out and short-term pressure that may face from the LDC graduation, which will be implemented from 2024 or 26. So parallel to this economic achievement, Bangladesh made massive social progress as well. The government has enhanced health and education related initiatives significantly to improve the current situation. The social safety network program are being expanded further to eliminate extreme poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, you are aware that South Asia is exposed to extreme weather patterns like sea level rise, flood, excessive heat, cyclone, landslide, erosion, so many. Even at a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, the consequences for the region's inhabitants and economy will be very, very severe. We should also remember that many LDCs and developing countries are disproportionately affected by climate change and hence attainment of the SDG is being severely impacted. This constitutes a serious injustice and must be acknowledged by all. Having all of these adversities, Bangladesh is the first LEC to establish a climate change trust fund from its own resources. And every year we used to spend more than 5 billion US dollar on climate adaptation. We are following a low carbon development path. As the second largest exporter of ready-made garments, we are exploring efficient option of circular fashion and textiles as part of the overall circular economy. To combat climate change, and even Secretary General's call for action for the next decade, and for enhanced SDG implementation, we are preparing a decadal climate plan, which we named Muzib Climate Prosperity Plan 2021 to 2030, after the name of our father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Muzib. We have also requested all our 48 CVF countries to prepare their climate prosperity plan to follow the concept of from vulnerability to resilience, and now from resilience to prosperity. As the president of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, Bangladesh, and the host of the South Asian Office of Global Center on Adaptation in Dhaka, we are promoting the interest of the vulnerable communities, nature-based solution, and locally led adaptation projects. As CVF president, our prime minister in October last called on all the countries for enhanced NDC, the midnight declaration. Distinguished participants, we are looking forward to COP26, to secure commitments from the global leaders to curb global emissions substantially, to keep the global temperature at 1.5 degree, to highlight climate finance, fulfill the commitment of US 100 billion yearly, technology transfer and other key issues. We equally expect cooperation from the developed countries to support the climate vulnerable countries and promote their interest in the COP26 platform. Finally, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought us to an unprecedented turning point and uh, simultaneously has cautioned us to meet the goals of SDG. I'm confident that through our collective effort, cooperation and solidarity will overcome these challenges. I thank you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Azad. I love that message of positivity. 
Um, congratulations again for Bangladesh. We had a question for you about, um, you know, what you can point to as key elements to uh, Bangladesh's success. And I think maybe you already answered that, highlighting the strong government support for the SDGs and the implementation plan. And I also really applaud Bangladesh's efforts to take the lessons that you've learned and help um, support other countries in adopting them. So um, unless you have one brief word, I think maybe we'll, we'll turn to our next speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we're going to go to uh, Ms. Isabella Teixeira, um, turning to the case of Brazil. Uh, please, Ms. Teixeira. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Brazil. Thanks for the invitation to join this group today. And thanks for the report, Jeffrey, and uh, your fantastic uh, uh, team. I confess that uh, I used to read the report to know more about the global progress on sustainable development agenda and also to understand better how we can play, we should play better in Brazil. Considering the national perspective to achieve sustainable development goals by 2030 and as we made considered millennium development goals in the past. I confess how painful uh, is to see the setback for sustainable development countries, uh, sustainable development in Latin America, because pandemic hit us, but especially what's happened uh, to Brazil. And uh, I think that we need to learn uh, and to analyze carefully what's happened concerning the race of social inequality and poverty, but also how we are moving uh, against the future when we go into the back to deforestation and also the lack of robust environmental and social policies in Brazil. Despite of the setback provoked by the pandemic, one of the key points of the report in my personal opinion is to highlight the importance of sustainable development goals to remain as the guiding framework for global public policies. I am very honored to be, power, to be, to be part of uh, the panel that proposed sustainable development goals before uh, uh, Hill Plus 20 conference, and also after this, the high level panel that proposed uh, uh, post 2015 agenda that you know today as 2030 agenda. Also, I think that uh, and the, the important sustainable development goals framework, uh, meaning when we highlight here's SDGs and the six SDGs transformation along with the agenda 2030 and the Paris Climate Agreement provide the strategic perspectives for the global, not only the green economy, but also uh, blue economy, white economy, purple economy, I can say a multicolor economy recover and to reduce the social inequalities around the world. As the report highlights before the pandemic hit, significant progress had been achieved on sustainable development goals in many regions and, and on many goals, but also it's clear to tackle global crisis, climate, biodiversity loss, natural resources, scarcity, and pandemic required a robust and strong international multilateral system. COVID-19 pandemic reveals the challenge that we need to face. We cannot move into the future without so with social inequality and economic informality. We cannot move in, we cannot, sorry, uh, that, uh, uh, Sorry, we cannot move into the future with social inequality and economic informality that the low and middle income countries are exposed to. But also make clear that STEM development goals is a powerful tool to face the challenges. Damage to exosystems in nature may lead to the emergence of other zoonotic disease and pathogens, possibly with much higher case fatality rate next time. It's absolute, it's a key observation and we need to understand what's happened, what are the consequences or additional consequences when you go back to deforestation, for example, in Brazil, in Amazon region. This is an absolute important, these additional impacts consider, for example, the emergence of arbovirus and the deforestation in Amazon, a critical and scientific and political debate today in my country. And climate change is pushing is as a part of the risk and vulnerability agenda, such as has already led to sharp rise in natural disasters, including droughts, typhoons, the impact of rising sea levels and heat waves, as the report highlighted to us. No country can single-handedly prevent, respond, and recover from the global shocks, as the report remembers us. And you cannot forget that we need to face it, to be back to discuss planetary boundaries, the limits, and the resilience of the planet if you want to move 
into the future considering the Sustainable Development Goals framework. I'm deeply sad with the data from Brazil, one of the sea countries that regressed more last year. Since Rio 92, Brazil has played as a leader on sustainable development on the end of adoption of sustainable development goals and Agenda 2030. The same with the climate and the biodiversity agenda with our engagement to achievement of Paris, agreement, Paris Climate Agreement and Nagoya Protocol in 2010. And you had, you, you had an active participation of the sustainable development goals proposal and Agenda 2030 adoption, as I mentioned before. What you see today is an impressive setback, even before the pandemic hit us. It's very important to observe this. The consequence of the new political arrangement in Brazil promoted since 2019 with the resume of the deforestation, not one in Amazon, all the, all the biomes in Brazil today are exposed to additional deforestation that in the past were able to block, to end, and, uh, and also to face consider Amazon region and the emptying of the social and environmental policies and the civil society participation. Without civil society participation, without democracy, it's impossible to move forward in the sustainable development future. Also about other, sustain, other sustainable development goals. National Congress Brazil approved a law that allowed the national, the, the strategic national planning and also the impacts of national budget to be oriented to consider sustainable development goals framework. The president of Brazil adopted a veto for this law. And unfortunately, you have the consequence that now the report is showing to us. Also, we cannot forget, we cannot forget, sorry, that how Brazil and, uh, had to have a national robust health system and also knowledge about public health and how Brazil took decision to face pandemic crisis. These are good example how Brazil is the public policy, the recent public policy that will impact and contribute for, contributing for the setback. The other side of the coin, it's absolutely important to highlight, highlight here, is that Brazil also is moving forward, considering the institutional arrangements and also subnational players, for example, to promote new regulatory rules for national for financial sector in Brazil based on the green finance and the climate risk. These are good examples and also how our national sustainable, our economic, our national economic and social development banks is adopting uh, the framework, sustainable development work, uh, framework to orient the financial office of, of development in Brazil. So we have these contradictions today in Brazil because again, of the role of subnational players and other institutions that they're looking for to preserve this agenda and move forward. I think that in the future, we need to analyze better this consequence and how the report will reveal uh, to us this, the impact. Finally, I'd like to remember that re the report reveals the urgency for Brazil to embark in a green, sustainable and equity recovery. It's a strategic wake up call for Brazilian society. And uh, I'm confident that the report would be helpful for the National Congress and for the subnational government in Amazon region, for example, that are preparing a proposal for green economic recovery plan driven by sustainable development goals and also climate net zero strategies. This is some good inputs that I'd like to highlight here to thank you very much for the report again, Jeffrey and uh, Emma and all the, uh, your team. And be sure that this will be very important for us as society uh, to look for how Brazil uh, will be back soon to the sustainable development world and also be back soon for the international cooperation. I hope that we can move forward. I do believe that, be, be sure that we're working hard here as, as society to convince people that we need to move in a new direction, stop the setbacks and go into the future to tell new good and sustainable stories based on the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, uh, to be here again and sure that this is a strategic and important report at this political momentum that our society is facing in our country. Let's do this together. I'm confident that we will change and uh, we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ministers Teixeira. And if you have one minute for a very brief answer to a question from Belinda in the US, um, maybe one action that G20's, G20 countries could take to support other countries in achieving the SDGs. 
It's a good question, of course, that one minute is not enough to address all the aspects, but two or three things are very important. The first one is that uh, you need, G20 must understand the local reality, local needs, and also how can bring it to these strategic perspectives, consider win-win dialogue uh, based on the present, if you want to move forward, consider the future. It's absolutely important that you can address local needs uh, with the global core benefits. In Amazon region, for example, that's so critical for climate stability, you have more than 25 million people that are there, but you need to connect things. You have the new economies coming, and then how we support this, for example, stand up for this economy, by economy, and what is the role of these new economies, for example, to tackle hunger and nutrition in Brazilian society. It's very important not only to business generation and new jobs. My, thing, my feeling is that if Brazil stop the deforestation, this is very important to observe. We need to start the conversation in the Amazon region. What will be the new lens? What are the new bases for the international dialogue to address climate stability and security? This is important that G20 should discuss. And finally, in my perspective, don't forget it. If you go into the uh, economic indicators, uh, you see that these countries that are part of the Amazon base, we are middle income countries. But when you go into the region, Amazon region, and you check the indicators, they are related to low income countries. So we need new lands from international cooperation. If you want to go into this reality, change and realign this, consider the challenge that we have to face climate stability and sustainable development. So it's a good, a good agenda for uh, G20 to looking for to address in concrete, concrete realities how we manage to run that zero emission, that zero uh, by emission by 2050. But also how we address short-term perspectives, how indeed we uh, can guide oriented by human development and the new relationship between humanity and nature. Let's discuss this based on reality. I'm sure that you can change. I'm sure that you can bring people together. I'm sure that you can play better than we are doing today. Thank you very much, Lauren. I have to go back now for a public hearing in Brazil Congress, exactly we are discussing this new trajectory, ecological agenda for Brazil in the future. Thank you very well, much for the opportunity, okay? Thank you so much for being with us and a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. We turn now, uh, staying with Latin America, uh, we're going to go to Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa, former uh, PGA and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defense of Ecuador. Maria Fernanda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. And, and of course, I would like to join my colleagues in, in commending um, the uh, SDSN uh, for this, uh, this uh, thorough and very revealing report. Uh, congratulations to Jeff, to the authors, but also congratulations to the good performers, uh, to Finland, to Bangladesh, to the Ivory Coast, to Afghanistan. Uh, I think that they really need to be congratulated for their efforts. So uh, I, I think that uh, this, this report, uh, this analysis of the first five years into implementing the 2030 Agenda, uh, as uh, my, my colleagues uh, have stated, is not at all promising, uh, you know, with a few exceptions that we just mentioned. So I think that uh, the report uh, provides uh, solid evidence on the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in fulfilling the SDGs. But yet it, it, it also reveals that uh, the, the barriers uh, to build more equal, uh, sustainable and resilient societies go beyond the current global health crisis and, and are deeply entrenched in the functioning of the global economy and, and the paradoxes and deficiencies of uh, national development strategies and global governance. Uh, one of the issues that struck me uh, in the report was uh, the columns of red dots in three areas of clear underperformance, uh, climate change, biodiversity laws and inequalities, including, of course, gender inequality. And, and of course, I thought about what is the common denominator? And, and I dare to say, number one, uh, our dysfunctional relationship among humans and, and between our societies and nature. And, and number two, the flaws in our institutions, uh, a global governance deficit, but also uh, the, the lack of trust in democratic institutions at the local level. So I think that in this sense, uh, the report reveals that 
the deepening of a uh, global inequality and in the lack of bold and informed decisions to, to consciously decouple development and growth from environmental depletion and deregulated job markets is, uh, is uh, it's so clear. I think that um, as the report says, um, inequalities are being magnified by structural determinants, both at the national, but also at the international levels. At the national level, we see, for example, the uneven distribution of income and jobs, gender inequalities, tax evasion, debt burden, et cetera, et cetera. And at the international level, we see unfair and unsustainable international trade, a technology transfer deficit, the increasing digital gap, illicit financial flows, weak tax cooperation, among other issues. So I think that these structural hurdles have been galvanized by the social, economic, and humanitarian impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and producing this setback for sustainable development everywhere, not only the developing world, but we are seeing the huge challenges of OECD countries. I think this, uh, the global pandemic should not uh, be seen um, as a cause, as the only cause of the setback, but rather as a magnifier of the negative trends uh, of uh, uh, an economic paradigm. And we have to say that uh, an economic paradigm that fosters concentration of wealth in very few while excluding uh, the great ma majority from development opportunities. So I think that this fundamental injustice uh, disables states' capacity to, to provide public goods, uh, depletes biodiversity and the functioning of ecosystems. And of course, all this leads to a deepening in, in poverty. I think that when I see the, the, the report, I think it's, it's a stark reminder uh, to decision makers that SDGs uh, are a toolkit for building forward better. And why is this so critical? Because the flow of COVID-19 vaccines, for example, fiscal funds and the first signs of economic recovery are mostly concentrating in the industrialized world. There is a real risk that inequalities will widen significantly between rich and poor countries. That, that's why I find the report a traditional a guiding entry points, very compelling in this particular case. The number one, of course, is inclusion, the leave no one behind and the, the circularity and decoupling principles that are so critical uh, when we are trying to redirect our policy choices. Uh, and I also think it's, it's uh, very telling that the International Spillover Index uh, is uh, another, I would say, dark side of the global inequality crisis. The most advanced economies often generate negative spillovers through environmental degradation, pro profit shifting, increasing income inequalities and displacement. While paradoxically, they do perform uh, the richer countries better in the SDG index. So uh, basically, uh, just to make our story short, because it's a very rich report, you know, three clusters of, of, uh, of uh, recommendations of the report. Uh, first, uh, recommendations uh, that address the entrenched global inequalities um, the need to combat the growing poverty and unemployment levels caused by the pandemic, prevent fiscal and public debt crisis in the developing world. The question is how to avoid a new lost decade for development, especially uh, in the global south. And in practice, this means what uh, the report uh, rightly uh, mentions, the means to increase the opportunities of developing countries to, to uh, uh, close the income and, technologically divide, and technological divide and take seriously the need for a global Green New Deal. I think that the, the report rightly calls for a profound national and global tax reform and for countering illicit financial flows. And this would allow uh, and provide states, especially those of the global South with uh, further fiscal resources to finance a green and digital recovery. In this sense, for example, the, the, the progress on the discussion 
discussion for a global wealth tax, uh, I think is very, very promising. Um, the, the number two cluster is uh, the virtuous uh, uh, cycle between development and the climate and biodiversity agenda. So I think that basically the second cluster of recommendation talks to the need for an ecological transformation. I think that avoiding a climate breakdown is in the interest of all of us. And uh, I, we have seen that uh, the, the weakest developing countries that are least responsible for the climate emergency, like Bangladesh, already bear heavy costs in floods, droughts, et cetera. So I think that there is a strong connection between economic transformation and planetary survival. And, and I think that the recovery efforts from the COVID-19 provide a, an opportunity to address the climate and inequality crisis simultaneously. How to do that, and I won't uh, um, mention again, but I think it's a very, very good advice, the six transformations outlined in the report to guide countries in their planning and policy efforts. Well, education, health, clean energy, et cetera, the six uh, the six transformations uh, that are, are suggested and proposed in, in the report. And in the cluster number three, uh, finally, is uh, uh, the need and the call for a rejuvenated and accountable multilateral system. And um, we, we agree that we need a more robust multilateral system to address the current global governance deficits. And I think that one example, uh, that is, uh, uh, as we speak, happening is uh, immunization. You know, a vivid example that global health diplomacy and cooperation are not working. Even if we agree that universal immunization is not only a human right and a shared responsibility, it's also self-interest and the best insurance policy of the world. And yet uh, UNICEF uh, last uh, information says that only in 2024, if at all, uh, developing countries uh, would reach the vaccination rates of the Western countries. So um, let's look at the COVAX facility. It has been insufficient, ineffective. Um, I think that uh, we cannot rely, uh, the developing countries cannot rely on charity and generosity for vaccine donations. Uh, there is a need for a fair and efficient, predictable multilateral facility and a flexible intellectual property and technology transfer mechanism. So I think that uh, multilateral efforts should, should foster for sure greater social ownership of the sustainable development goals at the national and international levels. The SDGs are not only a planning and policy tool, but a political and advocacy and a diplomatic instrument. And to better design and implement policies and investments to achieve the SDGs, we should also address what the, the, the report states, which is the data and statistics deficits. And I think this is critical. We need a standardized toolkit finer indicators, allowing better comparability among countries. And as we know, the VNRs, the Voluntary National Reviews, are central to ensuring accountability. And there needs to be a serious review of its methodology to ensure, for example, that they have built-in reporting on the COVID recovery plans. I would like uh, to conclude uh, that um, we see with this report that the SDGs are more relevant than ever uh, as a survival kit, as a human rights blueprint, blueprint. And uh, there is a lot of diplomatic, political, and technical homework to do. And I think that this um, new edition of the SDSN report uh, is undoubtedly a very solid and thorough instrument to guide and inform decisions uh, and policy and investment choices as countries and societies recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. I think that this report sets the alarm and I hope world leaders, decision makers will wake up, you know, to, to reconcile public interest human security and Earth's integrity with economic and policy choices. Uh, at the end of the day, the right policy choices uh, is um, you know, self-interest uh, and a guarantee uh, for a better future for all. So thank you so much uh, again, and, and back to you, Lauren. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Espinoza. And we had a couple questions for you, but I think you actually answered them. We had questions from Abdullah in Pakistan and Nazrin in Malaysia about um, different links with the COVID-19 pandemic, but you know, we covered that uh, quite a bit. So I think maybe since we're a little bit past time, I will just go ahead and turn it over to uh, Christian Kroll, one of the authors of the report for some closing remarks. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And I would like to close this fantastic event uh, by thanking our distinguished speakers for your very kind words about your about our report and your inspiring uh, points uh, from which we have truly learned a lot today. Thank you also to my co-authors uh, of this report. Uh, the idea to measure progress on the SDGs uh, that we started with the SDG index in 2015 was controversial at the time, but I think uh, our event today has shown uh, and the feedback that uh, this idea to measure progress on the SDGs is as urgent as it ever was. Uh, and there should you know, not be uh, any doubt that this is an important, uh, an important step in achieving the SDGs is to know how we're doing. But thank you above all uh, to you in the audience who are reading our report and who are bringing our report to life in your own special context. We as authors, we're always moved to hear how our publication is helping, for example, grassroots NGOs to request accountability for the SDGs from their political leaders. We as authors are always moved to hear from business women and men how our publication is helping them to think about sustainability in their own companies, for their clients, and for everyone that their business operations affect. And we as authors are always moved to hear from other researchers who get inspired by our work for their own publications. And this is so important because the SDGs will not be achieved without actual breakthroughs in scientific research. So please continue to reach out to us uh, and do send us your examples of how you find our work valuable. Get in touch via email. You've seen the address earlier, info at sdgindex.org. And even if you want to suggest ways how we can still improve, we would be most grateful because we have benefited from so many suggestions over the last years. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard today from political leaders who are at the forefront of sustainable development. So what I would like to emphasize at the end of our event is that with good performance, such as in the case of Finland or Bangladesh, comes also the responsibility to lead. So I'm asking especially those in the more advanced, in the wealthier countries to lend a hand to world regions that are still suffering so much more, especially during the current, current COVID crisis. This pandemic has shown, albeit in a very, very tragic way, how we as citizens of this world are all connected and share the same challenges. And it is only with multilateral cooperation that we will truly overcome those challenges. So with that, have a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you were joining us from today. Thank you again to the incredible report team. Congratulations to all of our wonderful panelists, Minister Skinari, Mr. Azad, Minister Teixeira, and uh, Ms. Espinoza. Thank you all of you as well. Again, one more time for joining us. Uh, please read the report online and we look forward to connecting with you online again. Thank you, bye now.